And we're live. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. Well, greetings, fellow godless rockers. I'm Steve. And I'm Tally from Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> Joining us here today is Thomas Westbrook of the popular YouTube channel, Holy Kool-Aid, where he battles pseudoscience, religious extremism, and dogma while promoting science. Welcome, fellow godless rockers, and thanks, Thomas, so much for coming on our show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Cool. All right. Science, skepticism, atheism, and more in this week's episode of Godless, godless Rockers. rockers. Also, we want to thank our patrons, Robert, Kenneth, Six Spider, Joe Davis, and Adrian for helping us make these shows happen. Please support us on Patreon. You can see the links in the description below. All right. So we want to kick this off with a little game of this or that. Are you down? Absolutely. Cool. All right, Thomas. So let's see what we have here for you. So you've played this or that before, it sounds like? I, I believe I have. You're like, sure, no problem. And, <laughs> unless the rules are, are wildly different from the, the usual. No, it's the usual. Just pick which one you would like. And then the other one, of course, you'd have to live without forever, right? Okay. Right. So the first one we have for you is related to Kool-Aid. I know that you say don't drink the Kool-Aid, but mm -hmm. I'm assuming you've probably drank some Kool-Aid. If you had to pick so. your poison and which Kool-Aid that it would go with. So here it is. <laughs> Purple Saurus Rex or Rockadile Red? Uh, I'm going to have to go with Red. <laughs> All right. I would have to agree. Yeah. I, I, I'm just going <laughs> to pick Purple Saurus to be different. Uh, and because <laughs> and I'm wearing an evolution sword. shirt, and obviously you're wearing, you know. Oh, y'all. Yeah. Y'all so, need science. So the dinosaur <laughs> and Darwin, it's like, I don't know, peanut butter and jelly. Okay. All right. You ready for number two? Mm -hmm. All right. So this one is related to Thanksgiving since that's this week. This week? Next week. This week. This week? I'm pretty sure it's this, this week. week. This, this okay. Thursday. Yeah, we have Thursday Dang. off. So, you know. Okay. Sweet. So um, this is related to that, and it is cranberry sauce via can or homemade. It's like partway through that. What were oh. the two options? Sorry, cranberry sauce via can or homemade? Oh, homemade, hands down. <laughs> Is if it it's your done right. mom's or your grandma's <laughs> or your own? Oh, I've never actually, uh, I don't think I've ever actually made cranberry sauce myself, <laughs> but I've, I've had some delicious homemade cranberry sauce. Okay, cool. All right, number three. This one's a toughie. Mm hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it'll be easy for you. Uh, James Randy or Penn Jillette? James Randy. Can you elaborate? With, I got to go with the OG. I've, I've <laughs> got to... <laughs> Old school gangster? <laughs> is that... he, he, is, he is the original... I mean, aside from like Houdini... Like he's been in the trenches fighting skepticism. He was suspended over Niagara Falls in a straight jacket and got out of it. Like that's pretty badass. And then at the same time, he's he's been on so many different shows. He took down Peter Popoff, you know, televangelist like that. He's demonstrated um, how to do psychic surgery that people do in the Philippines and show how it's all sleight of hand. And he's gone on Johnny Carson and shown that he had his million dollar challenge. I mean, I mm -hmm. I like. Pendulette, um, but he's he hasn't, you know, he's bullshit was okay, but like not to the extent that that Randy has been. Plus, I got to interview James Randy on my show, and I also um he signed a book exclusively for me when he wasn't doing a book signing at a conference. And so I th there's a special place in my heart there. Yeah, uh James Randy is pretty much the OG we, badass. We got to meet him at the Reason Rally. Yes, that very was briefly. really awesome. Yes, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I approve this vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next question we have for you, number four. This is a serious question. Very serious. Top or bottom? Top or bottom? <laughs> it depends what we're talking about. I think you know what we're talking about. 
<laughs> I'm going to say top unless it's bunk beds because bunk beds, it's really inconvenient to, you know. <laughs> Yeah, All it right. is. Yeah. Okay. Gotta take the ladder up. How annoying. <laughs> Kids love that. I guess it depends on your age too, right? That's one way to answer it. All right. <laughs> All right. Last this or that question we have for you. By the way, you have an A plus so far. You are you are you are um winning. You're winning this star student. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so this is number five. This is music related. We noticed okay. you like Metallica, and we were wondering, old Metallica or new Metallica? Oh, I didn't realize I liked Metallica on my page. It's yes, there. you did. Mm -hmm. You're guilty. Saw it. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go with with old. Yes, so. I'm with you. This bumps. Boom, boom. <laughs> okay, sweet. Which uh, leads so me past. To the question. Yes. What, a what, plus. what do you define as old Metallica? Oh, I, I, I am getting a little too much lag. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Steve, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a new place, and hopefully, I'll be able to. Uh, I, I minimized the video, so I think maybe if it doesn't have to process it on my end, maybe it'll like the bandwidth will go through better. But because mm. it's not having to show me your video. Okay. So yeah, for those of know. you guys who are watching, he's in a new place, just moved in there 48 hours ago and set up and everything. So it's just brand new and he's struggling a little bit with some sound and lag and things. So that's we'll what's going off on is... if he, uh, But hey, we're, we're still having fun and I st I've still managed to pass the this or that challenge. You sure <laughs> so, did. Yeah. That's what counts, right? Absolutely. Hey, so awesome. yep, that is totally awesome. And I agree with you on that last question is all I was saying. I was going to do a fist bump with you for the old Metallica. Um, and hey, I noticed you're on Rational Wiki. I'm so jealous. I think that's awesome. Oh, thanks. What does oh. it say about me? Very bad things. Yeah. It's like, oh, this guy. <laughs> you know, the worst just... skeptic and rationalist in all of YouTube. Actually, it's like he's a little bit too animated. <laughs> literally. Mm. <laughs> literally in, in more ways than one. And he has something yeah. against tasty drinks. I don't really understand it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do you want to start with the first of the more serious questions here? Oh, yeah. Here? Okay, we're going to get serious. All right. All right. All right. Um, okay. So... Let's see. We have people chiming in on YouTube, which is cool. Thanks, people, for chiming in. Um, we'll come back to them yeah. in a minute. If you ask something really, really interesting, yep. we will maybe add it in. Okay. <clears throat> do, do, do. I'll start. I'll do that first one. Um, Can you go up? Yeah. Ah, okay, there we go. Aha. All right. So, Thomas, please tell our audience about your YouTube channel. What is Holy Kool-Aid all about? So I set up Holy Kool-Aid a while back when I was going through the process of trying to figure out how the world worked from the perspective of someone whose worldview had been completely shattered. I used to be a young earth creationist for people who aren't aware that someone who thinks that the world was created in six days, the earth is literally 6,000 years old and that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark and all of that literal, you know, biblical literalism in one one ideology. And when I started to peel back the layers of that onion and realize that there wasn't really a whole lot of um, scientific fact to any of this, then um, I started asking, like, how can we figure out what's true? And how can we know if, if something is is true or not? And the first thing that we have to do is we have to be open to questioning it. We have to be able to, to be curious enough to dig deep and to, to really explore. And it, a lot of times religion tells you not to doubt. They tell you not to question. And that's mm -hmm. so contrary to any kind of explorative journey, any kind of process. So with I came at it from this approach that truth withstands scrutiny and that we should be able to scrutinize anything and it would still be true. And I've been doing that ever since on my channel. I try to keep my videos laser focused and I'll take an idea, whether it's uh, dealing with psychics or dealing with faith healers or anything in between. I 
cover the paranormal, the supernatural, near-death experiences, you name it. And I will dive into a topic, cover it in five or ten minutes, and hopefully throw in you know some kind of funny pop culture references and stuff too. I do animations, and I, I try to keep it interesting because I don't like when people waste my time, so I try not to waste theirs. And um, I try to keep people laughing, and, and even when we're dealing sometimes with serious topics, I, I try to not let it get too too heavy but sometimes you do have to to have that as well mm -hmm. well i really love your videos thank you so much for doing what you do out there in the world i appreciate you very much cool. and i'm sure Thanks. tons of other people do as well um do you want to yeah well i i want to kind of dive into that a little bit more because you said that you grew up a young earth creationist so uh what what type of christianity more specifically, did you grow up with, you know, how did your parents influence you? Is, is what, what made you believe that specific type of ideology? So I was a, a missionary kid and I was raised in a <clears throat> former Soviet Muslim country. And my parents probably, if, if you were to look at what denomination it was, there were, a, there was a lot in common with uh, Pentecostalism or at the very least they were charismatic but they didn't really associate with just one strict denomination. You could maybe say they were non-denominational. It was more multi-denominational because like the church that we went to overseas was basically every single foreigner who was a Christian would come. And one Sunday you'd have, you know, a traditional piano playing person, you know, a choir and whatnot. And then the next Sunday you might have a, a um, African um, ethnic like band that has like all these different traditional instruments and stuff. And then you might have a, a rock group that's playing like a, kind of what you might expect at a contem contemporary service. So we got anything and everything in between the pastor would rotate as well. And I got to kind of see different styles, different approaches. And, and that was really cool. But at the same time, when you start looking at the literalism that, that I was told, you know, I, I memorized massive sections of the Bible. I memorized the whole Sermon on the Mount, you know, big chunks of like the book of Philippians, multiple Psalms, you know, and, and all of that stuff. When you really start to look at it, th there can be some harm that comes about because one, you're not approaching the world from a rational perspective. And so it impedes progress. And two, you start having different alternative approaches that are put forth. So you, you'll hear about things like faith healing homicide, where parents will opt for prayer and faith. Things like pneumonia, or you'll have um, politicians mm -hmm. that say, hey, stem cells, you know, we can't actually do any research on on stem cells, even though they're just leftover cl clumps of cells in a Petri dish left over from IVF. And that's a, a soul in a, in a Petri dish and it's sacred, even though it's about to be tossed out anyways, they put their religious presuppositions about how the world works onto it. And so you have thousands of people around the world who desperately need medical care, who are fighting against the clock. They may only have two years to live and there's a specific illness that could be treated in that time, except that the research is delayed and it's put on hold and it's banned in the U S and then, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't until Obama came into office that they reversed that and people died as a result. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of harm. And my goal is to kind of expose some of the harm so that people don't just have this, this idea that, oh, religion is just good. And, and most people are nominal anyways. It's like, well, the nominal religious people, they're, they're a smokescreen for the fundamentalists who are actually having a significant amount of power, especially right now, political mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good points. Okay. So on so, that. Um, yeah, talking about that sort of thing. Um, so we met you actually at the Gateway to Reason. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we did. That was cool. It was fun hanging out. I think out. it was, that was back 2017? Yeah. That sounds right. Or last year? <laughs> uh, well, yep. that year is before. last year. might have oh. been 2016, but I think it was yeah. 2017. 20, so yeah. talking about the atheist movement, um, the atheist community has been a bit divided lately, and mm. we hope to change that. Uh, we use music to bring atheists together and let them know they're not alone. Um, and something I really like about you and what you're doing is that not only do you kind of share that mission, um, but you also have created tools, tools so that atheists can find each other and meet up via like conferences, groups, and more. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And where can they find the tools? 
so I put together on my website, Holy Kool-Aid, I put together a, a couple different resources. One of them is a list of all the atheist YouTube channels that I'm aware of. And there's, there's several hundred in there. And some of them are inactive and don't really make content anymore. Some of them have veered away, but most of them are, you know, they make content about secularism, about atheism, about science and philosophy, and, and they're all coming at it from a secular approach. And then I put together a similar list of atheist podcasters, and this is all free to access, free to download, you know, use it to reach out to people to find out, you know, oh, hey, what other podcasts are there that, you know, I could have some people on my show and promote if I like their work, or I could go on their show if, if they want to have me on. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for people to collaborate with others. And it's also a way for listeners to, if they feel kind of alone and they're like, I just came out of the atheist closet to my family and I feel shunned and ostracized and I need to find this community of like-minded people who've gone through something similar. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to show them that there is a place for them, that there's a very vibrant online community. And I've put together those resources and I also put together a resource to find a local community. And it's, it's not anything necessarily that, you know, I didn't, come up with these lists there were already groups so there's there's organizations like sunday assembly that has multiple locations that it's kind of like an alternative to church but it's very like humanistic and it's atheistic groups like oasis do the same thing uh there's multiple um atheist republic consulates there's skeptics in the pub there's there's other groups and organizations and so i just took all the resources that i could find and i just put it all in one place and i was like if you can't find something through here i've also got links to like meet up and stuff with the atheist category like if you can't find something through here maybe you can start one and maybe you can find one just by going on facebook and finding people in your area who are also you know doubting or who like different atheist pages or something and and then that way our, our community becomes stronger and mm -hmm. people realize that they're not alone and that they don't have to be alone mm -hmm. yeah which is a fantastic thing i think it's really great that there's just so many groups popping up everywhere and they're they're constantly coming in and have a resource to where you could find not only online support and online other um people that that share your your ideas and have been through the same things that you've been through but also in person you can go and actually meet people who've been through the same things and mm -hmm. and talk and you know um it's just really important and building that sense of community is really important mm -hmm. and I, I think it's really great that you put that list together and and i think a lot of people will get something out of it so mm -hmm. i definitely encourage anyone who's wondering they can check out your page or, on or your website i mean and and find that resource mm -hmm. and also you know it's good to mention to the people out there who might be watching this that you know you can actually start a group if you want um, these groups a lot of them have chapters steve and i started the years and years ago we started the recovery from religion important. um in portland <laughs> oregon we just were like there's nothing here for that so we started it and it was just amazing the people we met and it's just great. It can help heal you if you have issues and you help each other by sharing your stories. It's just great. So yeah, any any group that meets your fancy, if you want to get involved, you can. And if there's not something in your area, you can make it. Make it happen. Oh, yeah. And, and honestly, you know, I, I realize that atheism isn't exactly the most you know, sticky point to, to form a community around. It's like just something that we don't believe in. It's like, oh, all of us don't believe in God. Well, yeah, like all of us also don't believe in, you know, oh the God. giant blue gas cloud farting dragon that flies overhead at night. <laughs> but at the same time, there are things that we do all agree with just, just from that one, that one belief. And that's, um, we all believe that you can be good without God that separation of church and state is important and that our policies should be based in science and not in religious dogma. And mm -hmm. those are really important things worth fighting for because without that, you really can't start having a secular society that values humanism. You can't have anything that's based around logic and reason and faith because it's all dogmatic. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are important things and we all have a shared story or not all of us. Some of us have, have not gone through, you know, any kind of shunning or, persecution or hatred or anything and we we've have varying degrees of it but at the same time we have this this common shared identity and and we can say like you know what for many of us we have had family members that treat us differently we have had especially in the bible belt and in the south and the u.s there's so much persecution against 
atheists, even if it's just, hey, we don't really want to talk to you. We don't want you around our kids. We think that you're evil because we've been denigrated from the pulpit. You see it in the Muslim world where people oftentimes even face uh, death threats or they'll have you know their life in danger and they, they face honor killings as a result of being apostates and leaving the faith. <laughs> and it's horrific, but I think that that's something that we can, that we all share enough to, to be able to form communities around and to have support groups for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because, because uh, like you said, with atheism, there's really, if you don't believe in God, that's really all that atheism means. But really to accept that point, you have to kind of agree with a lot of those, those things that you pointed out. And it's really good that, uh, we can build communities around all of those kind of things. Um, what I, I noticed, I, I, I want to add, like I noticed when I got into the YouTube atheist community, there was so much division around politics and political correctness and social justice. And everyone wanted to shift the conversation away from where it started. They wanted to shift the conversation to these tangential issues. And I'm not going to say that that these issues aren't important or that they don't matter or that we we need to find better ways to talk about them or that maybe some people are a little bit extreme. Like, I, I understand that. And I, I think that there's a legitimate conversation to be had there, but it's a separate it's a separate area. It's a separate community. It's a separate thing. And for us, it's like if we lose sight of the things that unite us. We're never going to be able to take on these multi-billion dollar religious organizations. We're never going to be able to stand up to them. It's the the organizations that really stay on target, like the Freedom From Religion Foundation, that they're like, we care about one thing, and that's separation of church and state, and we are going to fight the legal battles to make sure that that stays in place. Mm -hmm. And that's why they've been around for like, they've been around for decades and they've grown and people care about it and they're passionate about it. And I was just at their conference. They had over a thousand people there. And if we can't do the same thing within our community and say, look, guys, like we got to stick together around the stuff that we agree on. And if we have differences and we have disagreements, that's fine. We're people. That's why churches have split into thousands yeah. of different denominations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we can't be divided on the really important issues like separation of church and state is a big one. Because the moment we get divided as atheists, these people come in, and, and we saw it happen in the last election, mm -hmm. where, uh, like you were kind of talking about in one of your videos, where you talked about the State of the Union um, in, uh, in atheism, where basically the moment that we got divided, now it might be a coincidence, but uh, Trump gets elected. You get a uh, New Earth creationist as his um, vice president. You get people in, in uh, all, all those areas of the government that want to push a religious agenda. And this is why no you matter climate what- Climate change deniers, you have things, evolution deniers. It mm -hmm. goes yeah, on and on. There are things we may or may not agree about. I think these issues are very important. And it's very important to keep in mind that there are very large, powerful, well-funded organizations that would put people in power that are creationists, that are that are religious, and then would tear down the wall of separation of church and state. And that those mm -hmm. issues are, in my opinion, way more important than a lot of other issues mm -hmm. that exist. Well, they're they're going after everything that has made our country great. It's you look at the 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 American Constitution, what really set it apart when it was written. And there's been there's been other countries that have, have followed suit since then. It's not unique in any any stretch of the imagination anymore. But what really stood out about it was that there was this shift away from a, a religious link between, you know, government and and religion. Mm -hmm. And so you look at even in England, where you know they had the Magna Carta and they had, you know, all these these little, you know steps towards you know individual rights and stuff and questioning the divine right of kings and stuff like that but at the same time even to this day the head of the anglican church is also the head of state it's the monarchy and mm -hmm. there, there's this this connection between the two of them even if it's just a little bit you know on paper even if they're not you know as as crazy literalists as we are in the states at least in the south the fact that the u.s literally set forth a document that said you know that that you know, the Congress is not going to make any laws regarding, um, you know, uh, 
religion, there's going to be a, a, a fine wall between, you know, separation between church and state. You have the freedom to practice any religion. You have the freedom to practice no religion. You have the freedom of speech to criticize religion. There's no blasphemy laws in the U.S. That is what I was going to go to next. I'm glad you mentioned it. Ooh, that one scares me because, I mean, I'm like... Well, this is my everyday, everyday spot. just way of being with blasphemy happening. 13 countries. <laughs> there's there's so many countries, uh, something like 13 or something like that, where you could actually uh, receive the, the death penalty for blaspheming. It's really scary. Yeah. I mean, I'm afraid. The, the, the fact that we have this idea written into our constitution of separation of church and state is really revolutionary. It's not unique anymore, but it, it needs to be upheld. And it, it's really important for everyone, for not just for atheists, but even for religious people who want to practice their own religion. It's really important that church and state are separate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the funny thing is that on paper that, you know, that they're like, oh, yeah, we need to we need to have uh, the ability to have all this religious stuff, you know, out there. We need to be able to have prayers in Congress. We need to have, you know, these religious invocations. But as soon as you actually show them what it entails, even the religious people don't want it. They just want a Christian government. They don't want a religious mm -hmm. government. It's yeah. and, and, and let me make that the distinction very clear. What I'm saying there is, yes, Christianity is, is a religion. But when you say like, OK, it's. It's open to all religions, right? Yes, yes, of course, it's open to all religions. You know, if you want to have another religion come in and give a prayer, have a Jewish prayer, whatever, we don't care. And then as soon as you have a Muslim prayer, or in the case of the Satanic Temple, a Satanic invocation, they <laughs> lose their freaking minds. Well, that's one of the reasons I love the Satanic Temple so much is because I think the Satanic Temple is extremely effective in teaching Christians, and well, particularly in this country, because Christians tend to be the majority and tend to be the ones that are pushing this agenda. And it really teaches them over and over again that they really do want separation of church and state because the moment the satanic temple comes in and says, oh, we're going to put a statue or we're going to do a satanic invocation. Coloring all of a sudden, books. The, yeah, coloring in books in, in, schools for in kids. schools. All of a sudden, everybody remembers that separation of church and state is a good idea. <laughs> Because they don't want other people's religion shoved on everyone else. You know, they don't want their tax dollars paying for for this stuff. They don't want to see a Baphomet statue on public property. Yeah. You know, they, they don't they don't want their kids to go to school to learn about how Muhammad split the moon in two. Yeah. Because they know it's bullshit. And so as soon as they start saying that we should all give equal time to this stuff and teach intelligent design along with real science. They're, they're making a compromise that I don't think that they realize the ramifications of it. Mm -hmm. And it, as soon as you start showing, okay, well, now let's also talk about the uh, the turtles that the, the earth is resting on. <laughs> no, we don't give we don't give equal time to the flat earth nonsense. We don't give equal time to um, geocentrism. We don't give equal time to astrology when we're teaching people about astronomy. We don't give equal time to uh, things like alchemy when we're teaching them chemistry. No, there is actual science and there are actual things that, that we know how the world works. We've come that far. We don't know everything, but that doesn't mean that we don't know some things. Yeah. And they're they're wanting to come along and throw it out and say, oh, yeah, we know it all, but it's from this ancient book that hasn't been revised in a couple thousand years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh. and it's, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. all I can say is thank you, Satanists, for <laughs> waking them up to the fact that maybe that's not such a great proposition because I think it's even more effective than if they see, like, uh, other – like the the Muslim ideas being given equal time or, or things like that, they all of the religious people tend to agree that you don't want Satan's viewpoint in there, and they don't really need to know the details of that. The Satanists aren't actually they're really atheists. They they're not you know really worshiping Satan. Don't give away the secret. You can say it. No one's uh, going to pay attention. They're not they're like still afraid. They're, they're not looking this. behind the curtain. And the, the, the religious they don't people see who are in any curtains <laughs> on either side, they're like, I'm not looking. They're just I'm not looking, but I don't want it. And if that means the I can't religious people who are flipping out, <laughs> the religious people who are flipping out are too scared to watch atheist channels like ours because that might be yeah. the devil tempting them. Yes, totally. It's true. Absolutely. It's true. They're literally mm -hmm. afraid of it. Um, 
All right, can we cut real quick to... Uh, yeah, you got a question or, or something you want to mention? We got something on the yeah. live chat that I thought was interesting. This comes from, by the way, thanks you guys for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, this comes from TV Tube Me. And they say, the religious say that atheists are taking over America when it's actually the other way around. And I think that's so true. There's so much like, if you were to watch Fox News, they love doing these stories about how atheism and atheists are doing something like horrendous and it's a big red alert. And it's mm -hmm. like, dudes, you guys have multi, multi, multi billions of dollars. It's probably like zillions with all the churches together zillions. combined. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like zillions of dollars. Okay. And you guys have all this power. You're even lobbying, you know, for our laws to be changed. Yeah. And what are we? We're, we're so tiny. It literally reminds me of like David and Goliath in a sense. Like, yeah, they are just so gigantic for, and we're just. We're so tiny, but David we are powerful. Is an but atheist tiny. And, and Goliath is the Christian churches. Exactly. Have, have you seen that <laughs> yeah. that comic where it shows the different world religions and like one of them you see like a Catholic priest and he's got like a little kid that he's, you know, fondling, and then the next is like there's like a woman who has taken her, her headscarf off and she's being stoned to death, and then there's like a, a pastor and priest and mm -hmm. stuff who are like they're following this atheist around saying, like, you know, you're a piece of shit, you're this horrible person, you know, you're going to hell and stuff. And finally the atheist is like, Enough. And they're like, Whoa, chill out, dude, stop persecuting us. And and it, it's like it's it's not persecution if we're such a minority. We're we're the smallest group, and yet we're we're the fastest growing group. People are waking up and they're realizing it. But you got the millions, hundreds of millions of, of Christians in the US that are like controlling our laws and they're um you know, they, they have churches on every street corner and they have billboards all over the place and they have deep, deep, deep pockets and people who attend every single Sunday and who do stuff and who are active. It doesn't, and, have, it doesn't and, end there because they also got the music. They've also got TV oh shows. Oh my God, so Christian on, music on is networks. ridiculous. If you look at Sirius Satellite Music Radio, there's a whole like religious category of Christian music Plus, and mainstream. it's Christian rock, Christian oh. heavy Christian they, I'm in Austin, they're definitely interested like in the mainstream genres. for sure. I mean, you, you, I, I'm in Austin, Texas right now. And yeah. Austin yeah. is usually seen as like, oh, it's it's a pretty good music scene, right? You've got right. South by Southwest, you've got Austin City Limits, you've got mm -hmm. people coming from all around the world to like, you know, enhance their craft and to, to get their name out there and stuff. So you'd think that all of the radio stations here would be fucking amazing. And yet you're literally sifting through like religious garbage. And it's it's not all of them. But like there are a lot of religious stations. And you'll turn on ones like, you know, da -da -da. I'm not gonna say what the station because I don't want to be sued. But uh, <laughs> they, they'll have like all these these different names popping up, and, oh, and it's, it? it sounds kind of catchy. It sounds kind of catchy at first, and you're like, oh, what's that? And then all of a sudden, it's like Jesus, Jesus. You're like, fuck. You know, okay. I wasn't expecting that in a, a decent song. You know. Yeah, one of my personal goals, um, I would love to see an atheist category, genre, whatever you want to call it, on Sirius Satellite Radio one day, where you know you can go there and escape every other channel's Jesus preaching in all these songs, because it's everywhere, it's in every type yeah. of music, pop, rock, you name it, it's there, yeah, it's in don't... there in the regular channels, and then they have their whole 30 sub genre Christian area, why can't we just have a single place we can go and know that we are escaping that? We don't have to worry about getting surprised by Jesus crap in our in our faces. Mm -hmm. It's like they're not getting enough of it in, in church every single Sunday. You know, they got to have the songs on the radio, too. And it's the same songs. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I stopped listening to Christian music a while back. And every once in a while, I'll like, turn on the, the radio and it'll be a Christian station. I'm like, oh, hey, it, it's that exact same song. I remember that song 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. it's 20 years ago. I don't know. No, never mind. I'm not well, going to go into ages, but. Oh, no, trust me. Ago, I, was, I was, I was listening to Christian music. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm older than I look. I have a, a beautiful baby face, which, which means that when I'm 40, I'll still be gorgeous. When I'm 40, <laughs> you say after saying that. Mm. Okay. Youngster. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Mm. Okay, I, I completely lost track of any idea of where we are in our questions. That's okay. So um, we did um, a live thing here. Do you want to? Can, oh. can I ask you? 
Can I ask you guys something? Have you have you noticed Absolutely. with Christian music the almost frightening fascination with blood? Like no. just well, just pay attention. Pay attention next time next time a Christian song comes on. They'll be like, you know, the blood of Jesus and nothing but the blood, and your blood has washed my sins, and it's the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. It's like, holy shit, <laughs> do they stop and think about this? Like it really <laughs> sounds it sounds like something out of like Sweeney Todd. No, more of what I've noticed is that all Christian music sounds like really repressed pornography. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, always like, like being on your knee. It sounds like oh, the most sexual song you can imagine. Except I want my knees before you, Jesus. I want to touch you. I want to touch your face. <laughs> if I can only hold your balls in my hand. Here I am down on my knees again. Oh, I yeah, just want to touch your blood. This head. <laughs> oh. Take a bath in your blood. <laughs> and take, take a bath in your blood. That would be like, wow. I'm pretty sure that porn would be illegal. I don't know. <laughs> there, there was, um, was it Elizabeth Bathory, who uh, Dracula's partly based off of, in addition to um, Vlad the Impaler, who notoriously would bathe in the blood of virgins to try to extend her life and keep herself beautiful. Yeah, that's how it's done. I mean, that's what so I that did. that it it just it just sounds like a typical Christian day. You know, you're supposed to eat his flesh and drink his blood and uh, go yeah, from there. And- <laughs> yeah, take, take a bath in it, swim around. Give him the ultimate praises. Walk, anyway. walk on blood, turn it into <laughs> wine. Yeah, all those things. Mm-hmm. God, religion's weird. It, like it, it seems it so normal is. when you're in it, and then you get out and you like look through the other side, and you're like, "Holy fuck!" Like this is this is pretty twisted. It's like, well, I think that that's the intention because you know the the. the of course, they teach you from when you're a child. I, I don't think that there, it, I, there's some quote out there, and I'm going to butcher it. But basically, if if you're able to keep people away from religion until they're 18, and and then show them, uh, you know, the just the different beliefs and everything like that. If, if if you're able to somehow do that, then no one would believe. But everybody. It pretty much uh, in almost everyone who is super religious was indoctrinated from a very young age. It's very rare that you'll find somebody that wasn't and becomes religious. Mm-hmm. It's really sad. Yeah. Or they, they don't know enough about the book yeah. or about, about science. You know, people, r- religion thrives on ignorance and it, it thrives on, on a lack of education. Mm-hmm. As, as soon as you really start to understand how the world works, and I'm, I'm not just talking like you hear a, a teacher in a biology class tell you that, you know, we evolved from, you know, primates and, or that we are still primates and we evolved from like, a, you know, event, you go far enough back, a single celled organism and that we're just chemistry and stuff. And you hear that and you're like, oh, it just sounds ridiculous. And or you take it and you're just like, oh, I guess that's just fact. But if you understand how it works, if you actually really start to to ask yourself, like, how do the scientists know that? How do mm-hmm. they know that that that's where the evidence points? And you start to look at all the different fields that confirm it and that point to it. And you start to look at comparative anatomy. There's there's a great museum in Oklahoma City. It's it's an osteology museum, and it's they've taken all of these different skeletons of animals, and they've completely stripped away everything but the bone. And cleaned it off, and it's still like in it, it structurally, it looks exactly like an animal would, except without any skin or anything or organs. It's just the bones. And they have everything from beavers to squirrels to humans to whales to anything and everything in between birds. And what struck me, like overwhelmingly struck me, and I knew this already going in, but I, I it never really hit me until I was actually there and I was observing like thousands and thousands of skeletons that are all like side by side that every single one of these species has the same bone structure. Like you look at the arms and you look at the different parts of the, of the arm and the radius and the ulna and and all the different, you know, fingers and stuff. And, and you start seeing this laid out from one species to the next. And you see the tiny incremental changes. You see the tiny little differences in the bones, but it's almost all the same. Like there's, there's a few animals that are a little bit off that, you know, you go far enough back 
Um, but even then you can actually, you can start seeing traces of like, oh, well, here's where the, the rib cage was. And here's where, you know, th this bone was, and here's where the hip bone was. And, and you start seeing it slowly shift in different directions, but comparative anatomy alone strongly screams that all, all animals are related. Mm -hmm. And then, he, then you start looking at the DNA and you start looking at how genetically similar we are and how you learn how DNA mutates. And, and then you start, you know, dating fossils and you start looking at the fossil record and you start seeing how it's changed and how you go far enough back in time and they get simpler and simpler and simpler. And, and all of this stuff stacks on top of itself. And that's just three things. There's thousands of pieces of evidence like that. Tens of thousands in all the different fields of science. And so to me, when I learned all the, all that stuff and I started seeing how all this stuff works, that was a smoking gun. I couldn't deny it any longer. I, I, I still, even to this day, I, I was so heavily indoctrinated against evolution and I was told, you know, oh, it's a lie and it's, you know, scientists that are trying to deceive you, spreading the lies of Satan. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had this, this inner kind of like revulsion mm -hmm. to the notion of evolution. Mm -hmm. And There's it was so much so misinformation. That even to this day, like I, I hear evolution or, or tens of thousands, or I'll, I'll hear someone talk about millions of years instead of 6,000 years. And and there's a small part of me that kind of like is a little disgusted and a little revolted and it kind of like uh, just this initial gut reaction. And it's it's less now than it used to be because I have I know so much more about this stuff and I know that it's fact because I know how we know it. And I know how we've studied it. And I've, I've looked at the evidence for it. And I don't think most people do that. It's like such a fundamental aspect of existence. Mm -hmm. And they don't even take the time to know it. You'd think at least they'd want to debunk it if it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And they go and try to figure out how scientists know that or why they're saying that. But they well, just, they're soon fed this story. And it's, it's sad. It is I sad. I think uh, actually kind of you hit on a key of, of why they wouldn't. Because you have that moment of revulsion. I think in order to be skeptical and to be able to understand concepts like this and, and really understand them, you have to be able to get over that m initial moment of revulsion and actually look at the evidence. And most people aren't prepared to do that. If th it's uncomfortable, if it makes them think, if it makes them it feel pain. like this shouldn't it's be the way pain. it is, then they're not going to look into it any further. And a lot of religious conditioning is about training you to have that initial uh, feeling, that initial revulsion, yeah. so that you don't look any further. If you can yeah. cause people to have that, most people are not gonna have the tools, especially because a lot of people here on our stream are talking about bad education in schools and um, you know throughout their lives. Most education doesn't really address skeptical thinking or critical thinking in a way that really reaches students and makes them understand how important it is and how to get over that initial revulsion. It could even not be a religious thing. It, it, it could be difficult just to accept that we're humans and we came from an, another species. That can be just, that alone can be difficult for people to, to, to get over. But if you can just get past that initial feeling and look at the evidence, I think it makes for a much more beautiful and poetic view of who we are and how we sit within the universe within all these species and in our relationship to everything yeah there, there's such a strong emotional battle that i think we are on the cusp of starting to win but we've been losing for decades and we're winning on the intellectual front religion doesn't have any evidence to back it up they're getting their ass kicked when it comes to you know the logical debate They'll, you know, you'll, you'll see a scientist go toe to toe against a, a religious person. You know, Sean Carroll will debate, or Lawrence Krauss, or Richard Dawkins, or you know, Christopher Hitchens, or someone, and they'll destroy them with facts and with with actual knowledge of how the universe works. But we're losing on the emotional front because they go to church every single Sunday and they're told that atheists are evil, they're going to hell, they're bad. You know, there's already a wall that's up there that you're fighting through. So you have to be really careful with how you approach it. Do you even call yourself an atheist? Do you say, you know, oh, I'm not religious or I don't believe in God and here's why? You know, what causes their wall to go up to have them suddenly shut down and stop listening to you? And what allows you to 
to build a bridge to connect to them and to, to interact with them. You know, we're losing this battle because they're they're so heavily indoctrinated with the notion that all scientists are lying and it's evil and they're they're told these tropes over and over and over again. Well, science doesn't know everything and it's it's gotten mm-hmm. a lot of stuff wrong before. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah, but name one thing that religion or that science has gotten wrong that was disproven by religion. It's <laughs> always disproven by science because it refines itself and it learns That's how the world works point. with the new mm-hmm. tools that it creates. Mm-hmm. And and so if I the reason I think that we're on the cusp of this the shift is we're learning. The 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 YouTube channels and the podcasts that are the most successful. Are there, it's it's almost like a natural selection process that's going on. The the channels that have the most you know really satiant arguments that resonate with us emotionally that we feel connected to. Whether it's man, I'm really pissed off that the Catholic Church is getting away with uh, raping kids and that they're covering it up, mm-hmm. or you know that that's an emotional thing that then causes people to, to be like, well, why was I following this in the first place? Let me look into it more. As soon as they've they've had that emotional switch, then they start looking at it intellectually and then they start looking at it logically and, and, and start using reason. But if they have these barriers in place that are so heavily closed to even opening their minds, then it's really, really hard to win that battle. One example that I'll, I'll give you is, is in my life, I, I was told, you know, you can't question it and that you know, you shouldn't even read, you know, you should be really careful even handling or reading, you know, the book of Mormon or the Quran or anything, because, you know, that's, that's letting, it's opening a portal for Satan to, to speak into your life and to try to deceive you. So I was scared to really look at any of this stuff seriously until I had two things happen. One, I had a youth pastor who believed in evolution and he was an old earth creationist. And I was like, okay, so you could still believe in that and still be a Christian. So suddenly I was like emotionally open to examining the facts. And then I had another Christian friend who told me truth withstands scrutiny. And, and so for me, it was like, oh, okay, like why not be able to, to look and to examine something? If it's true, it's going to stay true. And if it's not true, I don't want to believe in it. As soon as I had those two things, suddenly I was able to really dig deep into this stuff and try to explore it. And even after I had stopped really believing in it, there was still this kind of emotional, like, I don't know. And then I saw this debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, where someone in the audience asked a question that was, you know, what would ever convince you to change your mind? And I had been told, I had this emotional feeling against people like Bill Nye, against the scientists that like, they're out to deceive us. And then I saw straight in front of my face, I saw Bill Nye give the most just open, transparent answer saying like, just one piece of evidence and then you had Ken Ham that says nothing's ever con- going to convince me that the Bible's not the word of God. So that for me was, it was an emotional point where I instantly realized that I had been lied to and all this stuff that I had harbored against, you know, the, this scientific uh, group that is, you know, out to spread, you know, lies and stuff and misinformation because they just want to live a life of sin or whatever, for whatever reason that, you know, that the devil's just using them or whatever reason you want to give. I realized that it was horse shit. And I was pissed mm-hmm. and I, I was pissed and I, I felt like I had gone my whole life being lied to and missing out on a, a huge chunk of how the universe works. And for the first time in my life, I was really able to explore things without feeling afraid, feeling like I couldn't question, feeling like maybe I'll go to hell because I could mm-hmm. see where all of that was man-made and I could see how it was all bullshit. And it's, it really is a beautiful thing to have that freedom. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing about that. Um, I totally like identify with with that feeling of feeling like pissed off, like you weren't shown this other side, like like you were lied to. You just you weren't shown that there are other points of view out there. You were that's what indoctrination means, right? You're only shown the one side and not and you weren't privy to the other. But I would say even though at the time it's horrible when you are finally, you know, past that hump of that pissed offness <laughs> and you look mm-hmm. back, I, I don't know about you, but I feel really grateful that I, I was able to come to this other side, if you will, with these other people who are here on this other side with me and see looking back at it for what it is and not being wrapped up like some of my family members still are. I'm not like that. I somehow got out. I feel like we're the lucky ones. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah, and and it can be it can be lonely at first, 
Mm -hmm. It can be really lonely. It's scary. There's, there's a, a, a term I like to call post-deconversion depression. You go through it. You're like, where, where do I find my grounding? How do I reshape my worldview? How do I figure out, you know, something's true or not? Um, how do I start a community and have friends that now, you know, I'm not going to go to church or youth group with them. I got to look for friends elsewhere. I got to find new social circles, mm -hmm. you know, who still accepts me, who doesn't. And it can, you can lose a lot. I get emails from people who tell me that they've lost spouses, they've gone through divorces, they've they've told me that they're on the brink of suicide, that they feel isolated, that they've lost their jobs, they've lost custody of their kids. And it's it's really mm. sad that this is happening just because they say, I don't believe anymore. And the most mm. the saddest part about it is we cannot control what we believe. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I, you can tell me all day that, you know, hey, I will give you a million dollars if you just, if you believe that this phone is a tricycle. And I can tell you, I can look you in the eyes and, and I say, I swear, I believe it. The phone's a tricycle. But I know better. I'm lying to you. I can't change the fact that I believe that this is a phone because all the evidence that I've gathered shows it's a phone and it makes phone calls and it does phone things. You know? <laughs> well, I think, again, this kind of taps into, if you want to talk about the sinister nature of religion and indoctrination, I mean, religion will get away with what it can to keep people within its folds. So if, I mean, if we're talking hundreds of years ago, it would have been violence, and it still is today, but, but way more, way more intense and, and way more scary uh, consequences. And we're talking about today, it, it does what it can to rip families apart, to uh, basically blackmail you into, even if you don't believe, pretending that you do. And it's it's really hard for a lot of people to come out. I mean, some uh, for me, it was not that big of a deal, but for a lot of people, it is. And, I, and it's really based on um, that kind of idea. It kind of, Daryl Ray talked about it a little bit in the God virus and comparing, comparing religion and, and belief to a virus that really is parasitical and, and takes advantage of the host in a way. So th that's kind of where my thinking is coming from. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I, I think that of all the religions that have existed in the history of mankind, the ones that survive are the ones that play by their own rules. And they're not, you know, if, if they can get away with killing apostates they're going to kill apostates if they can use fear and manipulation and they can you know whether it's a, a jizzy attacks or something on on you know infidels who don't believe and who don't toe the line you know so you just have a little bit of an inconvenience or whether it's taking you out in the streets and slitting your throat open because you you know blaspheme the prophet these are all horrific things that are, are done to preserve the religious belief because you're going to be terrified to speak up if that's the norm, if that's what's happening. And right now we have to speak up because we can, we have a voice now. We yeah. have the option. Now we have free, right. free speech now. And if we don't use it, we lose it. Mm -hmm. I agree so much. It's yeah. the, uh, the ability to be a non-believer and to not face, you know, capital punishment, then if we don't stand up for it now, then we'll lose our voice. We'll lose our ability to question it. Well, they'll have blasphemy laws put back in place, you know, and th that's how religion has survived so long is it that it continues to adapt and to use every tool at, at its disposal. And the ones that are the most violent and the most manipulative are the ones that are able to crush every single other religion and rise to the top. Mm-hmm. It's true. I used to compare that to countries too, remember? Yeah. I'd be like, it's like a broomstick. It's a broomstick and whoever's got the top rung runs everything. They rule everything. And they're going to beat up everybody down below to maintain that top position. And all these people down below are trying to slaughter that one to get them down. And to stay on top, you've got to be pretty violent actually and crush your enemy to stay on the top and of that broomstick. It's the same with countries, well, I think, countries and well, I mean, religions. I think that there's different strategies, but I think definitely fear and intimidation is a very effective strategy. I don't think it's the only one. And war and fighting. <clears throat> it's, it's, not, I mean, it's not the only one, but the, the religions that are able to adapt, and that is an, a, a method of adaptation and spreading a, a religion, 
it's it it gives it a survival advantage. The reason I bring that up is because I think it's important to be clear that I don't advocate either of those ideas. I think that we can beat religion by legislation, by um, education. I don't think it would take violence and intimidation. Oh, to, oh, to no, 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 no. I, I, I know I, that I, neither of you were thank, saying thank that. Thank you for. I want to. Yeah, no, thank you. Because I don't want anybody to take it out of context. I yeah, think, th thank, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that the way to beat it is is to be violent. I'm saying that we have to be careful because religion has a history of violence, and that it's used it as a way of spreading the religion. And we've seen that some of the biggest religions have been the most atrocious. the The times that we've seen the the tide turning in the opposite direction, it's been like. Oh my God! All of a sudden, we have a printing press. People can read books. They can get access to the Bible, and that you know, and religion fought against that. They burned William Tyndale at the stake. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they didn't want people to have to be able to see it. They were losing power when that happened. And then we we have this shift where you know now we have the internet, and you don't feel alone because you realize that there's a massive community out there, and there's all these videos going viral online, and there's atheist subreddits, and there's atheist Facebook pages, and there's atheist meetups and groups and stuff. And suddenly you realize that this isn't just a one-off thing. This is a phenomenon and it's growing and that religion is losing these arguments because you're able to actually have an intellectual discourse and religion is no longer able to suppress it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I want to ask you our last question here because I think it kind of goes off of this. When we were preparing for an interview, uh, we kind of mentioned this before, but we talked about your State of the Union 2018 address. Um, where you talk about the past and current climate in the world of atheism. I'd be curious to know, however, what do you see for the future of atheism and what steps do we need to take to get there? I mean, for, for the future of it, I would love to see the U.S. get a little bit closer to the way things are in Europe when it comes to the average position towards religion. I don't think we're going to get rid of religion I don't think that it's going to happen overnight, but I, I think that when a politician stands up and says, hey, I'm re a religious believer and I, I believe in this stuff, that should count against them, not for them. They should be fighting an uphill battle to get elected if they believe crazy bullshit. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> So for, for me, I would like to see groups like FFRF really take off and grow. Um, they, they right now, they have a, an initiative where you can sign up to get text alerts. And if there's, you know, you put in like who you're, what, what your, your area is, the region that you're living in, and they'll say, oh, hey, like there's this senator that's trying to pass this law that you should go and call them and, and take action. So they're, they're forming these action committees. Stuff like that is huge. Very um, cool. I've seen a, a explosion of podcasts and YouTube channels. I want us to saturate the internet. So go out there and every time that you see someone who's spreading, it doesn't even have to be religious. It can just be pseudoscientific woo, like psychic bull crap and share links to my videos debunking it or share, you know, links to articles by, you know, scientific inquirer uh, or a skeptical inquirer, sorry. Um, or, um, you know, scientific American or, you know, different things that are, um, actually based in, in science and that have, you know, peer reviewed studies and stuff, you know, go after the anti-vaxxers, go after all this stuff. That's not true. And I think that if we saturate the internet like that, then every time that you see a Ray comfort or a William Lane Craig pop up, then if we're all speaking out, we don't feel alone. We don't feel just completely railroaded by this, like overwhelming, like, mob of you know crazy fundamentalist religious extremists but we'll be like oh hey like our people are here too and we're, we're here to to do battle but when i say do battle i mean an intellectual fight to say no i'm not gonna sit silent anymore this has to stop we have to stop spreading misinformation and we have to stop getting off to this anti-intellectualism wet dream that they have that somehow like oh the you know all the scientists and all the smart people they you know really think that they know what's going on but they don't it's 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 almost like nerd shaming, but like the nerds are the fucking smart people who actually understand what's going on and actually do the work to figure out how the world works. Those are the people that should be running the country. Those are the people that should be making the decisions, or at the very least, those are the people that should be informing the decision makers. And we're going to get there by spreading this stuff. Um, Absolutely. Yes, so. totally. Unfortunately, misinformation 
brings money and power to those people propelling it. So it's going to be a tough battle. You're talking mm -hmm. about like a battle, an online epic mm -hmm. war of battles of, of truth. Well, you no, know, just, and unfortunately, they have big motivations there for the misinformation because these are churches that, you know, their hand is in the money pot, well, money pot. Yeah, well, and you're we're trying to pull it out. Basically, they're not going to go easily. Churches or anything, well, anywhere. Well, when it's so based on followers, you can easily tell people what they want to hear and make money. Mm -hmm. Whereas in so many cases, when you're actually telling them what we know by evidence, it's not what most people want to hear. But it, that doesn't have to be the case, and mm -hmm. and I'm trying. I've been trying to kind of show that with with my channel a little bit more so with my podcast is that there are some really fucking cool things about the universe that are true. Like there isn't a single kid who goes out on a starry night out in the mountains and looks up at the Milky Way and just sees it glowing and sees shooting stars who isn't absolutely captivated by the universe who doesn't want to know what's out there. Who doesn't think to themselves, you know, are there other life forms out there that we could, you know, learn about? You know, we could discover, we could explore and, and spread out into the cosmos and colonize Mars and then see where we go from there. Like all of those things, like there is money there too. Like you look at Silicon Valley and how much money they've made with all of the different breakthroughs in computing and technology and, and advancing our understanding of all these new, you know, scientific breakthroughs. There's a tremendous amount of growth there, and it's just that we have to have this mindset shift away from, you know, that somehow if we just give money to God that that's where it's supposed to go and that, you know, we're going to get back some type of prosperity uh, by sowing this seed gift that we're going to get more money back and pay off our debts by giving 10% away or, or more and and funding these churches and, and funding all this stuff. and churches do some charity sure but there's secular alternatives that do all of the same charity without spending money on religious propaganda bibles without you know hiring missionaries without preaching you know they don't expect you to to stay for the message they they just do it because they love and it's genuine and it's humanistic so we can have alternatives it's not that religion is the only horse in town it's it has been a monopoly for far too long and it's starting to lose power and and we're disruptive and we're going to disrupt it and we're going to change that and i'm going to see to it yes hell yeah why because you rock <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so uh any questions for us thomas while you're here um yeah so you've been doing the atheist rock uh avenue yes you've been making songs and music and stuff about all of this stuff how did that how did that get started was there just a point when all of a sudden you're like hey there's there's not really a whole lot of of people in this um this niche was that part of it or was it you guys just were absolutely in love with rock and roll and your passions just uh inspired it i'd say it's close to the second question <laughs> Um, just to be really fast and yeah. brief because we want to make sure this is about you, but just real quick, yeah. um, we met while playing, we each were fronting our own bands and that's how we met. So we already had music and then, um, we got married and he was actually still Mormon and I was an atheist pretty much always. I think yeah. um, I just didn't know what to call it until my teens. Um, but then, uh, we, I was just looking one well, he came around actually from reading a book and he ended up getting more into the kinds of things uh -huh. I was watching. Reading like thing. Don't Christopher. do it if you want to stay religious. Yeah, he was like reading Bad books news. and it helped him to sort of come around. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we had this, I had an epiphany because I wanted to find some atheist music. I just wanted it so bad. I'm like, I need some kind of atheist rock music. And so I went online and I just scoured the whole internet. I found like Shelly Siegel, which was cool, but you know, acoustic. So, and then I found like some songs here and there, like Bad Religion had a song or two that sounded kind of atheistic. There was no effect sounded a little bit. There was just a very select few. In fact, I only could find about 10 songs. And I was like, what if we took these 10 songs and we made an atheist band and start out with these as our covers? And that's what we did. We learned those 10 songs. Mm -hmm. And um, they were cover songs, and we opened for Shelly Siegel like within 30 days of thinking up the idea. And we played the 10 songs. One of them was an original we wrote called Monster on Sunday. It was the first song we wrote. And I was like, okay, well, yeah. 
let's call it, we're Monster on Sunday, and he said, yeah. And well, I think one of the most exciting things about doing something like an atheist rock band is that we've recently had, you know, with, since the Four Horsemen and, and all these people, uh, like, um, coming out and saying wonderful things that really reach people, but it's on an intellectual level, and all these subjects have not really been tapped into in lyrics and song, not very much, and especially not in rock music. So like on our uh, album where we talked about pain, which is a song about childhood indoctrination specifically, and the pain that it caused Tally growing up, there's not a lot of songs about that. We, talk, we did a song called Stardust where we talked about the wonder of the universe. Like you were talking about earlier. And, and where th that we are uh, all stardust. That is it's just such a simple concept that has never been in a rock song. There's so much wonderful and really exciting topics that can be explored. Whereas when you listen to the radio, okay, so we were talking about Christian music, also just regular radio music. Like you basically just have party music and music about sex and relationships. There's this whole avenue of just really rich, really exciting, untapped ground that mm. we go to our first album. Now I've got a whole second album that we're we're in the demo phases of getting ready to go into the studio. And it's just really exciting to touch these topics and do something completely new. And uh, like you said, use our voice. Our, the way that we love to use our voice the most is through music. And to be able to do these kind of deep subjects is really exciting. And I feel like music brings people together no matter, you know, within the atheist community, it, if you like rock music and you like, um, you know, the subject of atheism, the different faucets of it, I think you would really like our band and you can come together with your pal next to you and <laughs> enjoy the music together. It's not something that's going to cause a rift or a divide, like talking politics and well, things so amongst us. Also, if the community. music is good enough, it can be subversive, even with obvious lyrics. We go for obvious lyrics, but I think uh, we're, we have some really good songs. We're going to have some really... I'm just really excited about album this. Album two is going to be it's just amazing. Nice. Blow some nice. minds. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I I know that oftentimes I'll hear the argument coming from religious people that is you know oh you just want to go and live a life of sin and I I think part of the mis misunderstanding there is that they they look at secular music and it's all about like sex and drugs and then they look at you know. Christian music and it's all about like, Oh, you know, living this pure life and stuff. It's like, well, what if we're not like, you know, yeah, sex is, is fine and stuff. And like you do you and, and whatnot, uh, drugs <laughs> and a whole nother thing, but, you you. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, what if some of us are just passionate about exploration and learning and we want to better ourselves and we want to be the best damn person we can be. And, and yeah, we, we want to enjoy this life, this brief moment in the sun. We want to take it all in because we don't think that there's that this is just a practice run. We're not just preparing for the next one. But at the same time, there's a lot more to life as an atheist potentially than just, you know, oh, just go out and be a hedonist. Like it's, yeah. Yeah, there's so much more. And, and it's just, you know, that's what we talk about. The that's so much what we write about. <laughs> the atheist experience. What it's like growing up. What it's like with these different interactions. What it's like seeing the news today. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's fun. Thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. All right. Absolutely. Well, we're going to wrap this up here. All right. Thanks again, Thomas, for being a part of our show. It's been uh, super fun. Thank you guys for having me. Sweet. Um, if you want to learn more and support his activism, please check out his website, which is holykoolaid.com. We have all of his links down uh, below in the description box as well. Uh, we also have music merch and more promo going online in our store. So please find that in the description block, box below. Check it out now. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. So until next time. We're Monstro and Shandai! <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Godless Rockers. <laughs>